Good afternoon, folks. Welcome back to Howard Chemistry. Um, we are going to talk about these guys today. Intermolecular forces. That's forces between molecules. Um, you notice I keep emphasising the between? And you're probably thinking, well, what else could it be? Uh, you can also have intramolecular forces. Like the intranet runs inside just one building, whereas the internet connects all the different buildings to each other. So um, well, we'll come back to them much later on. In the meantime, intermolecular forces. The SQA would like you to know about three different types. We're going to cover them in this video. Um, we're going to see what causes them, um, what effects they have. Um, the good news is we're going to start with one that you already know. Our old um, faithful London dispersion forces. Um, these uh, are between every single atom and molecule. Um, they are, if you remember back, I'm hoping that you can remember, they are caused by, oh yeah, the uneven distribution of electrons as they move around the nucleus in an atom. This causes a temporary dipole, um, which induces another temporary dipole in the neighbouring atom. Um, so if we were to draw this structurally, what could we have? We could have, yeah, so let's draw a nucleus here. Let's draw a cloud of electrons round about it. And I'm hoping that you can see that just by random luck, we've got more at one side than the other. So this is delta minus, this is delta plus. Uh, next door to it, we will have the neighbouring atom, or molecule, of course, works in them as well. And it will find its electrons are pushed away in a correspondingly matching pattern. And then you get London dispersion forces, briefly, between these two. Until, of course, the electrons all start to move again. And it knocks everything out of shape. So they are the weakest uh, intermolecular force by a long way. You can, they, they vary with, in strength though, of course, with the number of electrons per atom, or if you're dealing with molecules, the number of electrons per molecule. So they can get up to decent size, but generally speaking, they are the weakest of these forces, um, intermolecular forces. They do occur everywhere though, and please remember, trick questions, sometimes they'll try and catch you out with that. Uh, in giant covalent networks, you've still got LEFs between the atoms, it's just nobody cares because they're a thousand times weaker than covalent bonds. Type number two, and we're going to have a look at, this is our first new type. Now, the SQA has a bit of a mouthful for this. They call them permanent dipole to permanent dipole interactions. Ah, yeah. Perman permanent, get my spelling right, dipole. Permanent. <laughs> Dipole interactions. Now, these are what I was hinting about in the last um, video where I said one of the consequences of having a polarised molecule is it finds itself attracted to its neighbour, also polarised molecule. And this raises the melting and boiling points. And that's basically what these are. So if we were to draw an example of this is... Uh, a molecule called ICL, iodine chloride. So if we have a molecule of, let's pick a different colour, uh, we've got an atom of iodine joined to an atom of chlorine. So there's an ICL molecule. Now if we have a look at the electronegativities here, actually we can ask ourselves, is this molecule going to be polar? Uh, the answer to that, according to my flowchart, go back and look at the flowchart, uh, first of all, is this molecule symmetrical? <laughs> no, that's a no. So is there a difference in the electronegativities? I actually don't know the electronegativities for these ones. Um, uh, iodine chloride. Who's pinched my chlorine? There we go. Oh, chlorine, of course, 3. And iodine is 2.6. Ah, okay, so um, 2.6 for the electronegativity of that. And 3 for the electronegativity of chlorine. So yeah, you've got a decent delta, and this is going to be a delta, uh, hopefully you can work it out, this is the most pull. Remember, this is Chris Hemsworth, so this is going to be the delta minus, this is going to be the delta plus, which means any neighbouring atom of ICL is going to be attracted to this. So if we do another ICL here, you're going to get these permanent dipole, permanent dipole interactions between the delta minus end and the delta plus end. 
So permanent dipole, permanent dipole attractions, interactions, sorry, will occur here. So the what are they? They are attractions between polar molecules. And um, what causes them? Well, the fact that the molecules are polar, that's the giveaway. Uh, the delta minus end attracts the delta plus end. So what's the difference to these guys then? I think that's why the SQA has emphasized the use of the word permanent, because I just set up here that this this polarization comes and goes. This does not. It's permanent. Um, so these are stronger than London dispersion forces. I'm doing them in order of strength, in case you haven't figured that one out. Um, this is exemplified by the boiling points. For example, the boiling point of ICL, if I remember correctly, is 95 degrees Celsius for the boiling point of this. Whereas if you looked at the boiling point of a bromine, Br2, uh, it's something like, it's 50 odds, 55, I think. I'll need to go and check that. Um, why am I, has the silly old fossil screwed up? Why is it comparing ICL with bromine? There's a very simple answer to that. Um, I'm going to see if you can figure out what it is. Uh, I'll come back to it at the end of the video. I wish you could see how many people would spin forward and see what the answer is to the question by cheating going at the end of the video. Um, why on earth um, would I have done that? Is there possibly something I was trying to keep the same to rule out it affecting this difference in boiling point? Um, so that's permanent dipole, permanent dipole interactions, folks. You find them between polarized molecules. They're a fair chunk stronger than these. Um, and let's do type three now. Uh, I've run out of space on this. Excuse me, I'm just gonna get myself fresh sheet of paper. Type three, um, ladies and gentlemen, are called hydrogen bonds. Hydrogen bonds, spell correctly, hey. Hydrogen bonds. Um, where do they, what causes them, and what effect do they have? The same as I've done for the other two types of bonding. Well, what causes them is when you have a huge, two things actually, two conditions, a huge delta En, so there's a large difference in electronegativity, and also one of the atoms involved is hydrogen. Clues in the name, I suppose, eh? I say involved, I mean one of the atoms in the bond, in the covalent bond, because this is a super polarized covalent bond. In case you're wondering why, it's because hydrogen is tiny, absolutely smallest atom in the, in the universe, of course. Um, so there's a thing in physics called charge density. I'm not going to go into it too much. If you're a physicist and you've heard of this, then you probably know what I'm talking about. Because it's so small, it effectively increases the delta largely in this dipole and you get a massive um, difference in uh, charge. So where does it where does it occur? It only occurs in three different bonds. It occurs when you have hydrogen bonded to oxygen, hydrogen bonded to um, nitrogen and hydrogen bonded to fluorine. Um, groups five, six and seven. Uh, you probably can, hopefully can work out why. I did say you need the largest delta En, and if you cast your minds back to the patterns in the periodic table, remember periodic table is here, roughly. Um, I said, oh, that's a terrible representation, do apologize. Um, I said that the electronegativity increases as you go that way, and increases as you go this way, so the elements up here in the top corner, these are the highest electronegativities. Um, and it's N, O, and F. Um... What does a hydrogen bond look like? Well, it's type 3, so it's the strongest of these three intermolecular forces. Uh, and the classic way of showing it is in water molecules, of course, um, where you have the next-door neighbour molecule. Now, the electronegativity of hydrogen is 2.2, and I think oxygen 3.5, if I remember correctly. Yeah, oxygen 3.5, so um, 3.5, 2.2, that's a difference of 1.3. Um, this is definitely going to be polarised and you're going to get your delta plus here and delta minus here um, and the same thing here, delta minus, delta plus. And so the hydrogen bonds are going to occur there. Um, hydrogen bonds are so strong um, that they have ridiculous effects on things like boiling points. Let me show you. I've got a pre-printed slide here. It's great when technology lets you down. I just put a new cartridge in my inkjet printer and it's decided to partially block the nozzles. 
what I've got here, folks, is a graph of boiling point um, of, it says, group 6 hydrides. In other words, this is um, group 6 in the periodic table attached to hydrogen. So these are all compounds. This is H2TE. Uh, this point here is H2S. This point, oh, sorry, my point, geez, SE, hydrogen selenide. This one here is H2S. You notice we're moving up group six. So tellurium, selenium, sulfur, and then the top of group six is oxygen. So H2O there. Now these guys here are on a gentle trend upwards, which makes perfect sense based on the number of electrons in their molecules. I can't actually remember the atomic number for these, so I'm going to have to cheat and look it up. Excuse me a second. Sorry about that, folks. Um, back with this, this H2TE contains 54 electrons, this has got 36 electrons, this has got 18 electrons, this has got 10 electrons in water. Now, if you cast your minds back to London dispersion forces, that's what's holding one of these to its neighbour. Um, then you see this makes perfect sense because as the number of electrons goes up, uh, the strength of the London dispersion forces goes up. But also, if you extrapolate that backwards, wh water should be about down there-ish, give or take a bit, it's difficult to say. Now, I don't know if you can see these numbers, that is zero, that's plus 50, that of course is plus 100, that is about minus 80 Celsius. Water should in theory boil about minus 180 and we should all be dead. That would put a really bad crimp on our day. Um, but fortunately we haven't boiled as we're sitting here watching this video because uh, of hydrogen bonds. Uh, hydrogen bonds are so much stronger than London dispersion forces that it raises the boiling point of water by approximately 180 degrees. Um, it's also hydrogen bonds are also responsible for a couple of other properties of water. Coincidentally, you can see these ice cubes floating nicely in my glass of ice water here. That doesn't normally happen. But I don't want to give away too many of my tricks. We're going to have a look at just how weird water is. This liquid you take for granted all the time is seriously odd, and almost all of its oddities are to do with the presence of hydrogen bonding, holding one water molecule to its neighbouring molecule much more strongly than you would otherwise get. Um, I think that's all I want to say, actually, for intermolecular forces, folks. Thanks for listening.